Dr. Teeter completed his undergraduate degree here at Multnomah University in 2000. He went on to earn his MA at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his PhD at the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Teeter has served as a faculty professor of Hebrew Bible at Harvard Divinity School since 2008. He specializes in the literature and religious thought of the Hebrew Bible, understood within the historical context of its formation and its interpretive reception within the Second Temple Judaism. His courses cover a range of topics in literature, history, and theology of the Hebrew Bible with attention to the history of interpretation, both ancient and modern. Dr. Teeter's recent publications include Biblical Symmetry and its Modern Detractors, published in the Conference Proceedings of the International Organization for the Study of the Old Testament, and The One and the Many, The Past and the Future, and the Dynamics of Perspective Analogy with Dr. Michael Lyons in Isaiah's Servants and the Exegetical Origins of Early Jewish and Christian Identity. His presentation today is entitled, The World Seen, Structure, Worldview, and the Poetics of Genesis 1. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Teeter. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Um, just a heads up here, there is a lot to cover in a very short period of time, and there's really nothing else for it to, but to go very fast. So buckle up, and here we go. My remarks this morning are going to be uh, focused on the intersection between two foundational insights that I learned from my classes with Ray Lubeck back in the 90s. These are but two among the many profound, life-changing, uh, transformative perspectives that I and no doubt a great many in this uh, room have learned from him, whether directly or indirectly from his students. The first, I didn't realize I was going to be holding a microphone, but here we go. The first is the essential importance of attending to the principles of structure and literary design for understanding textual argument and meaning. And the second, the recognition that all forms of literary, artistic, or cultural production are to various degrees and in varying ways the expression of a worldview. That is a set of assumptions about the nature of reality, the world, time, and the place of humanity within it all. So in particular, what I'm going to uh, try and consider within the brief time we have this morning is how the structure and poetics of Genesis 1 embody a worldview. Now, I'm not going to be attempting to parse out the distinctive profile of this worldview, say its axiological or epistemological assumptions, its anthropology, or the contours of its teleology and implied metaphysics. Nor is it my goal to focus on the cosmology of Genesis 1 per se, though this is, of course, the locus classicus for such an inquiry into the Hebrew Bible. Instead, what I'm interested in exploring together today is what Sumerologist Pyotr Mikulovsky speaks of as, quote, the manner in which a worldview is rendered tangible uh, within a text. That is to say, the principled ways in which a worldview, uh, in which uh, elements of poetic structure can embody, engender, cultivate, or inculcate a worldview, a way of seeing, thinking about, and experiencing the world. So as we're going to see, the literary structure of this text, of Genesis 1, is designed in such a manner as to disclose its truth claims about the world from multiple distinct but complementary angles, vantage points, and apertures. The world seen within Genesis 1, the world as seen there, is a world seen multiply, in a manifold manner. So my claim is that attending to this multiplicity of perspectives is key to understanding the vision of the world that this text embodies, the worldview that it renders tangible. So, one way to think about the structure of Genesis 1 from the top level is as a tripartite composition with an introduction, six days of creation, and then a conclusion. Now, these three uh, units all have a complex internal structure, so let's look first at the central uh, panel. Here there are si is a six-part division created by the identical opening and closing of each day on days one through six. And God said, and it was evening, and it was morning, day one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? Um, the days are treated in consecutive linear order. Uh, obviously, and this strict pattern is absent in the opening and the closing panels, the introduction and the conclusion, even though the closing panel constitutes day seven. 
This six-part block of consecutive days is as widely recognized uh, and subdivided into two sets of three by a variety of internal features of content and language. The first set of days pertains to the ordering of time and place, and the second set of days concerns the creation of living creatures to inhabit those places. Each set represents a progressive three plus one movement. So in both sets of days, the third day is longer than the rest, containing an extra bonus act um, uh, uh, in both the first and the second set of days concerning plants, fruit trees, etc. So thus, we have two panels that are both structured as progressive three, point, uh, three plus one structure. One, two, three plus one, one, two, three plus one uh, here. So as I said, we're going to go fast. The two sets are parallel to each other, being mapped onto one another by a variety of features, as you see here. And this, uh, uh, again, as widely recognized, uh, follows a pattern in which um, the, the days map onto one another, let there be light, let there be luminaries, uh, and so forth. So each day maps. Again, I won't cover this because this is widely recognized within the literature, but the first set of days concerns forming, the second set of days concerns filling. Now, a recursion of this pattern also obtains in both cycles of days, um, um, uh, th that it obtains in both cycles of days also obtains on the next level up on the structural hierarchy when they're taken together, including the seventh day. Again, one, two, three, plus one, culminating in the provision of plants. This is the term asiv in Hebrew. And then a one, two, three, plus one, again asiv. And this occurs on the larger level as a uh, one, two, three, plus one, ending in the seventh day. Now, the term seven and the term asiv are both anagrams of one another, the same set of letters, okay? So the seven days of the chapter are thus arranged as two climactic three plus one sequences that themselves recursively combine into a higher level three plus three plus one uh, sequence, again, culminating in the blessing of the seventh day. Now, again, this is widely recognized. Less widely recognized is the following. So besides this linear progression, each set of days also contains a pattern distribution that it, of features designed to support an alternative uh, and complementary structural principle, that of inverse symmetrical correspondence. So if we're looking at the first three days, it opens and closes with the provision of light and the provision of seed. The statement, God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was good. The statement, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the statement, God uh, called the dry ground land, and the gathering of waters he called uh, uh, seas. And then in the final line of day one, you have a feature that has always puzzled commentators. Why is it that the first day does not use the ordinal, rishon, but the cardinal, echad, yom echad, day one? Okay. That is given an answer to some degree when one looks at the first line of the third day, which says, Yekavu hamayim mitachat hashemayim el makom echad, one place, yom echad, makom echad. So all these kind of line up in a pattern distribution. Same thing happens with the days, uh, uh, days, three, um, uh, days four through six. Again, beginning with lights and ending with seed, moving on to the two, sorry, this is strange, the two rulers which are made, the larger and the smaller, these rulers in the sky plate serve to do what God does on day one. God uh, distinguishes between light and darkness, and then the luminaries will distinguish between the light and darkness, and they are to rule. Um, this is followed then by the stars. Moving over to day, uh, to day six, it begins with the creation of the land animals and then the two rulers, male and female. And these rulers uh, serve, uh, rulers on the land, uh, serve, um, serve um, are, are, are created, as it says here, in God's image and God's likeness. Now, while the term for rule differs in both, mashal for the uh, heavenly or celestial bodies and uh, kvash um, or rada in the case of man, and woman, the uh, term that is focused on is the image of God. And as you can see here, the term for rule and the term for image are both more or less anagrams of one another, mem, shin, lamed, and the, and the sibilant tsare, lamed, mem. Okay, so um, tselem and mashal. So again, focusing on what's above and what's below. 
So to flip the axis here, you can see that you have what's above and what's below and what's above and what's below, all with an ordered pattern of features on either side. Again, complementary with this progressive structure that we looked at. Now again, recall that the double cycles of days are introduced and concluded with a parallel segment that, or parallel segments that form an envelope or an inclusio uh, around the whole. And this is the first uh, portion. In the beginning, God created the skies and the land. And speaking of the land, it was formless and empty. That is, it had no prepared form or order and also no inhabitants. Uh, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, the conclusion is much more complex than that, where you have this very strange set of sentences. And they were finished, the skies and the land, and all of their hosts. Again, they were formed, the skies and the land, and the, um, filled with their hosts. And God finished on the seventh day his work which he made, and he shabbatted on the seventh day from all of his work which he made. Now, that's a strange set of sentences, but if you look at it, the first and the, the second one both use the exact same verb, finished and finished. The second and the third both have uh, on the seventh day the work, his work which he made, and the first and the third both have all of. Uh, that you have there. What's more, if you look at the, those that are coded purple on uh, there, that is to say hosts and work, there's an interesting feature. Uh, um, uh, their host, Tseva'am, uses the term Tseva, which can mean host, army, but also hard work. Similarly, the term for work, Malachto, is certainly means work, but it has the same letters as the term for angel, malach. So these participate in a rather unusual way. So moving along into the center here, and so God, oops, I didn't want to fast forward. God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because, and now we're going to go backwards, on it he shabbated from all of his work which he created, that is God, to make. These, by the way, are the birthings of the land and the skies, inverting the skies and the land that you have there. And then you have on the day when they were created, kicking off what's going to happen in a Janus-faced manner uh, in the story to come. So the introduction anticipates the double pattern of day cycles in days one through six with the notification that the land was uninhabitable and empty, tohu vavohu, and the uninhabitable waste is first made habitable in the initial three days, and then its emptiness is filled in the second set of three days. And then going to the conclusion, it begins with the statement that the skies and the land and all their hosts were completed. The first series of days depicts the completion of the skies and the land. The second series of days depicts the completion of the hosts of heaven and the hosts of earth. <sighs> so these parallel brackets, this inclusio, also supports a wide, uh, chapter-wide inversion symmetry that um, here pairs the celestial and the terrestrial realms and their corresponding population and rulers. They're brought into alignment. And thus, what is happening on the uh, uh, internal, um, internal to each cycle of days, corresponding to um, the, the corresponding inversion symmetries that we have there, is by means of the opening and the closing bracket, this inclusio, made to obtain on the chapter as a whole. This recursion of the inversion symmetry of the individual cycles on the level of the chapter as a whole is similar to and concurrent with what we saw with the three plus one structure uh, earlier. Or to rotate this on to the, the really rotating the, the orientation of the diagram spatially to reflect across the horizontal axis, something like that. Anyway. <laughs> the structure is thus doubly reflected, both internal to each cycle and between the two cycles, depending on which of the uh, concurrent structures is in focus, the three plus one forward translation sequence or the inversion structure. Different, and this is key, different relationships come into focus both between the days in each cycle and between the two cycles of days, depending on whether one is considering the relationship from the perspective of the uh, alternation structure, A, B, C, A prime, B prime, C prime, uh, matching domain with inhabitants and moving progressively from forming to filling, or from the standpoint of the inversion symmetry, as we saw here, in which mirror cor the mirror correspondence between celestial and terrestrial realms is most prominent. Both structures, importantly, um, obtain recursively on both levels, that of the doubled three-day cycles and that of the chapter as a whole. And this really is almost like an origami structure, where you have, it begins with what is formless and empty, the first set of days gives it form, the second days of, uh, set of days gives it filling, and it concludes with the heavens and the earth were finished, that is the heavens and the earth were finished, uh, along with all their hosts, the hosts of heaven and the hosts of earth. 
So it is a contemplative matrix of a kind. So returning to our initial query then, we're now in a position to consider whether and how these multiple recursive structures or structural patterns relate to worldview. Now it seems clear that the forward and inverse patterns each bring different elements into focus or comparison and therefore contribute in distinctive ways to this question. The linear progressive pattern of Genesis 1 moves from beginning to end in a talic manner, that is it's goal driven from the outset. It is iterative, sequential, and climactic, but crucially it is also cyclical with the parts combining into a larger whole in the form of a hierarchy of nested recursion. Now, this structure is profoundly related to the overall conception of time and history it seeks to engender. Indeed, it establishes a pattern for the numerically determined, here three plus one, birthing cycles of the history of the world, a subject that's gonna occupy not only the remainder of Genesis, the Pentateuch and the primary history, but the entire prophetic corpus, um, as well as especially the books such as Daniel and Chronicles. Repetition, cyclicality, recursion, new birth and blessing or its opposite are of foundational importance for the worldview brought to expression in Genesis 1 and reflected throughout biblical literature. It would be difficult, in fact, to overstate their importance for understanding the conception of time, of history, of creation within this corpus, what is and what was and what is to come. These are the deep mysteries of time and of the divine plan for the cosmos, mysteries which we ourselves, alas, do not have time to pursue further at present. <laughs> So turning quickly then to the inverse symmetrical pattern, that was the forward symmetrical pattern. The inverse symmetrical pattern in Genesis 1, uh, we've seen that these serve to bring into relational comparison not only what is temporally before and what is after, but also what is spatially above and below in terms of an overall world picture. This doubled three-tiered schematic world model is one that is characterized by a symmetrical relationship between the celestial and terrestrial spheres but there's no indication that the model itself is spherical. Now, while no ancient visual depiction of the world model of Genesis 1 is extant, one finds no shortage of attempts to reconstruct such, whether popular depictions, old and new, or more academic efforts to, uh, uh, to, to uh, emulate the iconographic style and conventions of ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia, as you see or may see up there. Um, uh, now, given the undeniable and manifest relationships between the literature and thought of the Hebrew Bible and that of the surrounding ancient Near Eastern cultures, this is an eminently understandable undertaking. But a rigorous, and compar uh, a rigorous comparative analysis must also allow for what Benno Landsberger uh, called the Eigenbegrifflichkeit, the potential conceptual autonomy of a culture. And I'd go further to say that one needs to allow for the Eigenbegrifflichkeit of individual portraits or accounts within the Hebrew Bible. Now it seems to me that these, uh, um, that most of these attempts at any rate, have been led astray by comparative iconography in relationship to the notion of a dome or firmament uh, in Genesis 1. Here, as you see up there on the other hand, is an alternative um, representation of the schematic world model, which while admittedly leaving uh, much to be desired artistically, comes closer, I would uh, argue, to capturing conceptually the relationship between, um, uh, or the relationships brought to expression through the structure and language of Genesis 1 itself, the overall gestalt. Here, a structure comparison is established between two rulers above and two rulers below. Uh, this is, in both cases, divinely delegated rulership in which the created beings continue the work of God. The very things that God does in the first sequence of days are maintained through delegates in the second set, an imitatio dei, on the celestial and terrestrial um, uh, planes. Here, the plate, the rakia, and its face corresponds to, it matches the face of the land. But what is one supposed to be thinking of in terms of this plate? You saw it's often seen as a dome or a kind of snow globe or a, a circular um, um, idea. The term rakia uh, is derived from a verb, raka, that elsewhere means, among other things, to stamp, to pound out, to beat uh, firmly. So, uh, for example, it's used of the silver used for plating idols in Jeremiah 10. Uh, it's um, a silver beaten flat, kesef meruka. Now, this con uh, conveys really nothing necessarily about a dome. Instead, I would posit that what's um, key for understanding this conceptually um, uh, is uh, 
that, that is this rakia, this sky plate, is a recognition of its structural and therefore conceptual relationship with the land. And that relationship is itself illuminated by consideration of Jeremiah 10. Now, Jeremiah 10 is a complex passage polemicizing against the idols, the gods in which the nations put their trust, uh, and contrasting this with the praise of Yahweh, the eternal king, the fear of the entire earth. Now, this whole passage is structured as an elaborate chiasm, and at the very center of the chiasm, the crux or the pivot, the, the donut hole in the middle of the donut, is found an entire sentence in Aramaic, the Aramaic donut hole. And it looks like this. It's a, it's a chiastic micro-poem. The gods who the heavens and the earth did not make will perish from the earth and below the heavens, these ones. So you can see that gods and these match not only be with having the same referent, but with spelled with the exact same letters, first three letters. Moving on to the heavens and the land corresponds with the land and the heavens in inverse order. And at the center, you have matched making and perishing, two semantic opposites. But note here that the two terms are spelled exactly the same way with the exception of the guttural letter ayin and aleph that are exchanged. Now, what's important to see is that these look, uh, well, this is really important. Check this out. These purple ones here, uh, one thing, if one's paying close attention to them, that they'll notice that these are not spelled the same way. In fact, these are two alternative dialectal expressions of the term land in Aramaic, arka and ara. And what's extraordinary about this is this is quite similar to the term rakia. They both look like an anagram for rakia, the rakia and the land, which already match. Okay. So back to Genesis 1. Now it seems to me that rather than depicting a dome, so that was kind of what I was pointing to right there, rather than depicting a dome, the sky plate is intended to represent a mirror image of the land, um, a symmetrical pair. And this relationship is given linguistic articulation. It is rendered tangible uh, in the perceptual similarity between it, the rakia, and the Aramaic equivalents for land, arka, arka and its structural correspondent, that is to say, its structural correspondent in the overall structure. Now, similarly, tripartite structures um, uh, above, in between, below are ubiquitous, uh, as you'll know, within the Hebrew Bible, and especially within priestly literature. But compare, for starters, the tripartite Ark of Noah, itself a microcosm of the entire, the external world, or consider the organization of the sacrificial laws in Leviticus that you have right at the beginning, the Ola, the offering that is entirely offered up to God, the Chatat, the, uh, the in-between offering in which the meat goes to the designated priestly um, 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 intermediaries, and the shalamim, those uh, in which the meat is largely retained by the offerer. Again, above, below, in between, insofar as what in belongs entirely to God, what belongs to the intermediary, and what belongs to the people in general. Same sort of concept. But the overall symmetrical shape um, uh, and of this conception, and in particular the parallel between humanity and the rulers above and the rakia, reflects a deeper intuition about the nature of the world, namely that there is a deep correspondence between the celestial and the terrestrial realms, the seen and the unseen, between the hosts of heaven and the hosts of earth. And this correspondence points to, hints at, begins to disclose the multifaceted realities of what Michael Heiser would often refer to as the divine council worldview. Now, given this relationship, it should come as no surprise that the sons of God, often elsewhere a designation for celestial beings, members of the divine council, fall in a like manner to humanity in Genesis 6, or that, conversely, the king of Babylon can be lamented as the, quote, morning star, Lucifer, the son of the dawn, who has fallen from heaven in Isaiah 14, or the king of Tyre can be likened to a guardian cherub in Eden, the garden of God, both alike in their cosmic fall. The same correspondence underpins the notion of celestial patronage from its classic articulation in Deuteronomy 32, where the nations are divided quote, according to the number of the sons of God, uh, to the book of Daniel, where Yahweh's angel battles the prince of Persia and anticipates the coming of the prince of Greece, um, and with many other reflexes throughout Genesis through 2 Kings, especially regarding mysterious encounters with angelic beings on borderlines. Perhaps we'll hear something about that in the next paper or not, I don't know. Um, it, it lies behind the judgment of the gods of Egypt and the plagues of the Exodus, now a three plus three plus three plus one uh, cycle that patently inverts Genesis one, ending in the ninth with yehi choshech, let there be dark, 
instead of let there be light. Um, and it also anticipates the significance of the Anakim, the giants uh, in the conquest of the land, as well as the continuation of that theme in Samuel through Goliath and then through the defeat of the various giants of David's uh, mighty men uh, and so forth. Indeed, the relationship between the sons of God the celestial hosts and humanity, is a recurrent one throughout the Hebrew Bible. From the descendants of Abram, the third Adam, who are promised to be like the stars of, in the heavens in number, to Jacob's vision of a stepped ladder reaching from heaven to earth on which the angels of God are going up and down, and where his descendants are promised to be like the dust of the earth, to Joseph's dream of 11 stars, the moon and the sun all bowing down to him all the way down to, uh, and you know, and so on, all the way down to the final verses of the book of Daniel, where at the end of days, ba'acharit hayamim, those who have insight are going to arise from the dust of the earth and, quote, shine like the brightness of the rakia. And the, those who justify the many are going to be like the stars forever and ever. This is the conceptual world of Psalm 82 and of Isaiah 24, where we read, in that day, the Lord will punish the host of heaven in the heavens and the kings of the earth upon the earth. And then the moon will be ashamed and the sun uh, will be abashed. And the Lord of hosts is going to reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem and his presence will be revealed to the elders. All of this is not even to mention the fascinating and extraordinarily robust legacy of these ideas in Second Temple Judaism, in Qumran, and in the New Testament. Um, this intuition, for example, clearly underlies Jesus' instruction to pray from the, for the coming of God's kingdom on earth as in heaven. Here we're dealing with stereometric thought, to borrow yet another choice phrase from Benno Landsberger, which generates a totality with a double accent, a whole that is more than the mere sum of the parts. In fact, a world that comes into being and continues to exist in the tension between two dipoles and their interaction, a coincidence of opposites. The world in its completeness is understood as heaven and earth, uh, 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 and the seen and the unseen. Humanity is male and female. Time is day and night, common time and sacred festival, reshit and acharit. Uh, life is productive creation and rest, dynamism and stasis. Creation itself is unity and diversity, sameness and difference, a hierarchy of flourishing with rulers and ruled on every recursive level. These binaries are not static, but generative and multidimensional. They open up a dynamic cognitive space in which thought can move back and forth, up and down, inside and out. And this is what is recognized about how parallelism is designed to work in Hebrew poetry. But to limit parallelism to a manner of structuring poetic lines is to profoundly underestimate the cognitive noetic dimensions, uh, the cultural world and the manner in, of thought from which parallelism itself arose. And related to this, one must note the special role that language plays in historical anthropology generally and in reconstructing a worldview uh, in particular. For Genesis 1, especially important here is what some would classify under the rubric of scribal epistemology or onomastic epistemology. That's the relationship between similar words and letters, their actual shape and sounds and paradigmatic relations relative to one another that are here taken to reveal meaningful knowledge about the actual world itself, relationship between words and shapes of letters. What does Asif, plants, have to do with Sheva, seven? What does ruling, la memshelet, have to do with image bearing, but selem? What does the sky plate, the rakia, have to do with the land? This, too, is another aspect of the symmetrical or stereometric thought pervading not only the construction of lines within biblical poetry, thought rhymes, if you will, but the entire worldview and way of thinking that produced parallelism in the first place. So in brief then, attending to the multiple structural patterns and linguistic correspondences within Genesis 1 allows one to recognize the complex and subtle ways that the verbal shape of this text is designed to engender and to embody a worldview. Indeed, the world seen in Genesis 1 is itself a contemplative matrix for thinking about the nature of reality, of time, of the relationship between what's above and what's below, what's before and what's after, and especially in its position at the beginning and head of all. Uh, it primes, prepares one to contemplate the predictive rhythms of history and the mystery of time and the divine plan for the ages that will follow. The world, that is, both seen and unseen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Teeter.
All right, you should be able to look now using Slido and see some of the questions that have been generated during this session, and we'll have just time for a question or two. And, and the first, of course, that has a number of likes is if this is published anywhere for further reading. Not yet. Not yet. Hold on to your seats. That actually is a really good reminder that we're going to ask you to please refrain from doing any of your own private recording of today's events. Multnomah is live streaming the event and we'll do audio recordings, but out of respect for our presenters and their work, we'd ask you not to do that. But like Andy said, not yet. So it'll be here soon for you. All right. Let's see. What else do we have? It looks like um, we have a question that has a number of likes here. What is the significance of man being made in the image of God given this, these connections between humanity and celestial beings? <laughs> both of whom, as, as I tried to emphasize, both, both the celestial and the terrestrial rulers are both created beings that do what God does. So again, what we're talking about here is an incredibly fruitful way of constructing thought and thought patterns. That is what, what parallelism is really all about. And you see this in the best works on Hebrew poetry. But it can really encapsulate an entire treatise, the relationship between what's above and what's below. There's many things that could be included in this. And all the discussions of the image of God and what it means um, capture some of this. The point is that it creates this dynamic space in between two ideas that is much more productive than simply stating the thing. So it's a fruitful way of constructing a world. So I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that, I think. The burning question of the day, however, our last one for Dr. Teeter, is what connections do you see between the structure you articulated for Genesis 1, the structure of the temple, and John's vision of the new creation? Okay. All I can say here is that, is that I'm not exaggerating when I say that you cannot overemphasize the importance of these structures and shapes for the overall conception, the governing conception that runs throughout this entire literature and the kind of culture that produces it. So uh, again, it would, it would be a, a totally different paper, but one that one can analyze this in innumerable ways within the Hebrew Bible. The temple, Mount Sinai itself, the offerings themselves, all of these, it's recursive, it goes all the way around the world. And this is the important point. What these literary devices do is they teach you a way of looking at the world. And the way of looking at the world itself teaches you theology. Yeah. It's a way of seeing. So that's what really what we're talking about. And that's actually what I learned from Ray in this, the relationship between structure and thought. So thank you. Beautiful. Would you please thank Dr. Teeter with me? Thank you.